And when you are pursuing the presence of God, you need to understand that Satan is going to seek to do things to keep you from going there. Well, I don't want to discourage you, but I'm going to visit in the book of Job this evening, Satan's attack on Job. Now, I'm not trying to uh, put you into a situation that, you know, you're looking to see Satan everywhere. But I just cannot get away from this. I just kept drawing drawn to this. So I'm going to do this this evening. And if you uh, go to the book of Job in the first chapter, that I'm going to be reading throughout the book. And so I'm not going to read a text to start with, but I'm going to be reading verses as we move along. Uh, whenever God moves in a church, whenever God moves in your life, you can expect certain responses from the adversary. In fact, I was with a pastor in a church, and uh, twice within a week's time, his freezer did something that should never take place. In fact, the repairman came in the first time and said, this never happens to this type of, you know, freezer. He's back there a week later saying, I don't understand this. this. I've never seen this happen in 30 years of doing this work to see this happen twice in a week's time. And I looked at the pastor and I said, welcome to revival. Welcome to a move of God. I said, because every time God begins to move, there are going to be certain responses that will take place from hell. And when you are pursuing the presence of God, you need to understand that Satan is going to seek to do things to keep you from going there to try to discourage you, to try to get you to say it's not worth the price going in that direction and believing God to do those sorts of things within our lives. One author puts it this way. During revival, activity increases on both sides of the divide. You can have God do this wonderful God activity in your life. And I've watched people in revival where God just touches them in such an incredible way where it, it's above and beyond the normal. And, you know, they're just like, wow, I'll never be the same again. This incredibly profound moment in their life only to have the same person, you know, eight, ten weeks later, perhaps, uh, be dealing with the biggest conflict uh, and the biggest challenge uh, they've ever faced within their life. Activity increases. It can be true individually. It can be true corporately. There are even those who experience what some describe as spiritual backlashes to things that God does. In fact, it's not my text for tonight, but I love if you're, if you're preaching 1 Kings chapter 17, it's the preliminary to revival. You go to 1 Kings 18, it's the revival itself taking place. You go to 1 Kings 19, it's the aftermath. And it's not pretty. Jezebel gets upset with Elijah. And stuff happens as a direct result of God's stuff. Now, I don't say that to discourage you. I don't don't want to frighten you away from a move of God. But I do want you to be prepared to understand that this really is a spiritual battle. So I want to explore for just a few moments from the book of Job how Satan may attack you personally. And then I want to quickly review the armor that God has given to you to stand against the adversary. And then at the close, give us opportunity to receive prayer. Opportunity to respond to the Lord and to begin to put into practice some of the things that give us the victory over the enemy. Would you pray this prayer with me? Heavenly Father, open my heart that I may hear what you would say to me. Change my life. Make me more like Jesus. In his precious name, amen. Let's look at the anatomy of the spiritual attack on on Job. Satan can and will attack us and those around us both our persons and our properties. Job chapter 1, verse number 10 from the, new, from the NIV. 
This is Satan speaking. Have you not put a hedge around him and his household and everything he has? You have blessed the work of his hands so that his flocks and herds are spread throughout the land. But stretch out your hand and strike everything he has and he will surely curse you to your face. The Lord said to Satan, very well then, everything he has is in your hands. But on the man himself, do not lay a finger. Then Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. I want you to notice the following. First of all, everything that happened was father filtered. Everything that happened was father filtered. Satan launched the attacks. Let's be very clear with that. Satan launched the attacks, but limits were placed by the father. You can touch this. You may not touch this. You can do this. You may not do this. Now, I understand that in some way, Job's case was a special test between God and Satan. But it also serves as an example of the way both God and Satan operate. This attack, first of all, involved Job's finances and his possessions. He went from wealth to near poverty overnight. He went from being the wealthiest man in his region to becoming a man who was basically impoverished in a moment's time. Now understand, some business failures are simply market forces. Some are poor decisions. Some are bad management. Some are circumstances beyond and outside of your control. But some failure are satanic attacks to steal from the child of God. There are some who need to say to Satan, take your hands off of God's money that's been given to you to steward. So Satan's first attack was against Job's possessions, that which was connected to him by way of property. And Satan will seek to steal from you that which God wants to place within your disposal. Secondly, in Job 1:18 and 19, the attack was extended to Job's family. Understand this, Satan does not play fair. Let's read verse 18 and 19. While he was still speaking, yet another messenger came and said, Your sons and daughters were feasting and drinking wine at the oldest brother's house when suddenly a mighty wind swept in from the desert and struck the four corners of the house. It collapsed on them and they are dead. And I am the only one who has escaped to tell you. Satan does not play fair. He will seek to attack vulnerable people. Now, that's not to create fear. Some of you will not remember this because you're way too young. I am getting so depressed now that I have so many stories that but some of you may remember a particular colonel in the U.S. military named Oliver North. And I remember his testimony before Congress. And I know that for some people he's a hero, for some he's a scapegoat, for some he's, you know, whatever. But there was a line that he said that really registered with many, many people. When he was talking about the security he had placed around his house. Not because he was personally fearful, but because he understood that the adversary, the enemy, would seek to strike out at his kids. 
And he basically said to this particular party, I'll meet you personally anytime, anywhere. Leave my kids out of it. How many understand Satan is not fair? He attacks vulnerable people. Job's kids were not a part of the conversation, but Satan attacked them. Now, let me hasten to say this, because for those individuals who see a demon under every bush, may I remind us, one-third of heaven's angels fell. Did you catch that? One-third. That's a minority. That means we have him outnumbered two to one. In every single situation. He only, because I do not believe that he has the ability to create. I may be wrong, but I believe if he could create, he would flood this place with demon spirits. He can't do it. So we have him outnumbered. But it is to say to us, what I don't want us to be fearful, I also don't want us to be foolish. Some of you need to be sure to cover your family in prayer and in the blood on a regular basis. To understand that Satan will seek to take advantage against your children. So you need to pray for them and to plead the blood of, of Jesus over them and put a covering, put the hedge around them. Ask God to put a hedge around them in the way that God put a hedge around Job. In verse 21 and 22 of chapter 1, Job responds to these attacks. In verse 20, at this Job got up, tore his robe, shaved his head, then he fell to the ground in worship. And he said, naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I shall depart. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised. In all this, Job did not sin by charging God with wrongdoing. Now, I'm not going to get into the theology of did God take it? Did God take it away? I just want you to see Job's response. He believed. That it was God who had taken. We did not understand Satan's part in this. But what Job does is he responds to the situation by worshiping the Lord. He's just lost his wealth. He's just lost his family. He's in an incredibly difficult time. And his response is to lift his voice before the Lord and begins to worship the Lord. Worship is spiritual warfare. May I tell you that there will be moments you will come to God's house and you will not feel like worshiping. There will be moments in your daily time that you will not feel like having a daily devotional. You will not feel like praying. If I only worshiped when I felt like worshiping, there would be many times I would never worship you heard about the man who said, I'm not going to church today. I don't feel like it. I'm 45 years of age. I can do what I want. Those people don't like me there. I don't like being there, and I'm not going to go. You cannot give me any good reasons why I should go. His wife said, I can give you two. You're 45 years of age. You're mature. Number two, you're the pastor. There are going to be moments that you do not feel. You see, I don't worship because I feel like worshiping. I worship Revelation 4.11 because he's worthy. And when I begin to understand that, the worship was not dependent upon my emotions. Worship is dependent upon his worthiness. Yeah, well, if I worship but I don't feel like it, I'll be a hypocrite. No, you're worshiping because he's worthy of worship. You're not worshiping because of emotions. You're worshiping because he is worthy of receiving your worship. 
So you can go through a difficult time. Satan can be attacking. Your possessions, your property, your family can be under attack. And your best response to that is to begin to lift your hands and to lift your voice and to begin to worship the Lord. Whether that's in the corporate setting as you worship or that means at home by yourself, you turn the CD on about full blast and you begin to lift your voice before God and you play it so loud that the neighbors three houses down hear you. But it doesn't matter because you are going to worship because you are in the midst of a war and there's something about the worship that begins to change who you are. Job does not charge God with doing wrong. He begins to worship. I noticed that healing began to take place uh, in my life after the unexpected and tragic death uh, of my youngest brother in a military accident. Uh, And the following Sunday, the entirety of the family, uh, my immediate family, his wife, her family, were all sitting together in the same church. uh, And it happened to be that I was at the end of the row as I looked down the row and saw all the members of the family, hands lifted in the air, tears streaming down some faces as they began to worship the Lord and in the worship healing began to take place do we have all the answers no did it mean that there would not be some days of challenge oh there were days of challenge but it meant when we began to worship something began to be released and when you're in the midst of the battle with Satan your best response is to begin to worship the Lord and so you lose your job and you say blessed is he who gives and he who takes away blessed be the name of the Lord uh, I love the story of the, of the preacher who's been held up by a highway man many many years ago horseback days and, and, and this guy's robbing him and the preacher says I just want to give God thanks He's, what are you giving God thanks for he said number one you're just taking my possessions and not my life Number two, it wasn't much anyway. So you didn't get much. And number three, I'm glad you're holding the gun and I'm not. You see, there's something you can do to worship and give thanks to God in every circumstance and every situation. The next satanic attack was on Job's physical body. In chapter 2, verse 4, skin for skin, Satan replied, a man will give all he has for his own life. Stretch your hand. Strike his flesh and bones. He will surely curse you to your face. The Lord said to Satan, very well then. He's in your hands, but you must spare his life. Father filtered again. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and afflicted Job with painful sores from the soles of his feet to the top of his head. Now, not every sickness is a direct attack from Satan. Some sickness is my folly. Failing to dress for the conditions is an example of that. If I am not appropriately dressed for the conditions, I cannot blame Satan for my stupidity. I'd like to. My father used to talk about the person that crammed their size 12 foot in a size 7 shoe and complained about the foot pain. (laughs) He said the problem is not the shoe, it's the guy who owned the shoe. Some sicknesses, not Satan, it's mine. Some sickness is simply the result of living in a fallen world. You see, when Adam fell and sin came, everything was affected. And because of that, there are some times that good people deal with bad stuff because you're living in a world that was affected by sin. Some sickness is a genetic situation. How many know that you inherited things from your parents? Some of you, some of you are pointing at your nose already. You know, I got blessed with this nose. I didn't ask for it. You know, there's a lot of things in my family line I didn't ask for. I wanted to be a basketball player. What are you laughing for? You know, when you're 5'7", 5'8", on a good day, you don't leap well, and you're not particularly fast. 
all of which I inherited. You know, a career in the NBA was not going to happen. You know, that's just genetics. I didn't ask to be born with a hairline that's thinner than some. But I've got more hair than my sons. I said to them when they were young, enjoy your hair now. Because both of your grandfathers are bald. It's in the family line and you are likely to lose your hair. So, you know, I, so I didn't really care what they did with it when they were teenagers. I knew it wasn't going to last anyway. You know, just enjoy it, man. It's gone. You know, I didn't ask to be born with eyes that are not as strong. as There's some things you inherit. There's a propensity in my family to heart conditions. I didn't ask for that either. My father dropped dead of a heart attack. His mother had a pacemaker put in. I have to deal with the fact that it's a reality of life. It's not a sin issue. It's a genetic issue. That I have to respect that. And there are certain things that, that my wife and I have done in our lives to deal with the fact that we have a certain genetic predisposition. Why is it that calories like me? You understand what I'm talking about? And the older I get, the easier they come, and the harder it is for, to get them to go. You know, it's like, you know, and I understand some of the stuff about, you know, metabolism and this and that. And it's genetics. You know, it's a part of life. But there is some sickness that comes as a direct satanic attack. And the root of sickness comes from Satan. So I don't have any issue in praying for the sick and beginning to deal with the spiritual th things that are underneath and to begin to take authority against spiritual strongholds. And you may be under a spiritual, physical attack and we want to believe God with you that the healer is still in the house. If you would go to Job chapter number 6 and verses 8 through 10. We see another attack that Job experiences. Job is speaking. Oh, that I might have my request. That God would grant what I hope for. That God would be willing to crush me. To let loose his hand and cut me off. Then I would still have this consolation. My joy in unrelenting pain. That I had not denied the words of the Holy One. Now here's what I want you to see. Job was so depressed, he wanted to die. Satan attacks you by bringing depression on your emotions. Now again, hear me. Some depression is clearly clinical or physical or genetics. Our son went through a depression that was probably related to an overload on his emotions and the stress he was under. But some depressive thoughts especially that come out of nowhere, when that is not what your propensity has been, when that is not your tendency. They may well have a spiritual origination. You find yourself praying and just wishing that you would, would, could just die, that you could just no longer exist, and you're under a severe emotional attack. It may be that you're under a spiritual attack on your emotions. Individuals who are normally full of life and love life and suddenly they find themselves dealing with these thoughts, I just wish I could die. That's where Job was. He just wanted to die. He is tired of it. And some of you may find yourself there where you're just overwhelmed with these feelings. I just would like it to be over. And you're dealing with a spiritual attack. In verse 21 of the same chapter, the attack is in the area of relationships. Notice what he says here, verse 21. And he's speaking to his friends. Now you too have proved to be of no help. You see something dreadful and are afraid. Now first of all, Job's friends have brought inaccurate charges against him. In fact, sometimes when I read the book of Job, it really disturbs me. Because I've been guilty of saying some of the things that Job's friends have said. 
I, I read some of the statements and say, man, that's true. And then discover God said they were wrong. That really messes my mind. It's not that they were wrong so much theologically as that they applied it the wrong way. They made some assumptions. Well, Job, if you're going through this, it must be because of. It's the story pre preacher that I knew. He'd been an officer in the Assemblies of God in his state. And in his later years, had resigned from that because he wanted to travel as an evangelist. And so he was, he was fulfilling a life stream, just traveling among the churches and ministering. And, and one day he was involved in an automobile accident. Left him for many, many months in recovery. And I remember that right after that accident, I was preaching at a church. And a lady came to me and she said to me, What sin do you suppose was in brother so-and-so's life? I tried to be very, very patient. And kind. And I said to this lady, because what I really wanted to do was slap her. In Christian love, in the name of Jesus, beat that devil out of her, you know. But I said, you know, I suppose that what happened is he made a turn in front of a car that was coming that he didn't see. And I don't think it had anything to do with his lifestyle. You see, sometimes we are quick to assess blame. And Job's friends were doing that. And so Job is dealing with these unfounded accusations. And some of you have faced accusations from others that are not true. Now, I'm not saying that your friends are demons. Well, in a couple of cases... I am saying that sometimes Satan will use words from your friends' mouths to try to destroy you. And they become his verbal mouthpiece. So when Jesus says to Peter, get thee behind me, Satan, he's not saying that Peter is Satan. He's recognizing that in the thing that Peter was saying, it was the verbal mouthpiece, the expression of what Satan was trying to say to him. And some of you have gone through and are going through and will go through moments where individuals in your life will bring accusations and they will say things and Satan will use those things. Notice this attack left Job feel isolated and alone. Some of you have been let down by your friends. Facebook is a very interesting thing. I've discovered things I did not want to discover. By the way, Facebook is a wonderful, I shouldn't say this, but Facebook is a wonderful tool for pastors. Because we discover so many things about our people. By the things you post. And the things you say about yourselves. I have discovered, I've discovered some things that really, really concern me. But a, a lady came on the other day and, and she'd made, and, and she's just opening her heart. And going through a very difficult time and she makes this statement. She said, I found out where my friends were. You know, those that, that rushed out and those who rushed in during the time of crisis in her life. Now understand, sometimes there will be people, it's not that they don't love you, they don't know what to do. They don't know what to say. And some of them are gifted to say the wrong things at the wrong times. You ever meet people like that? They have a knack. They just open mouth to rearrange their feet. They just had this marvelous ability to say the right thing the wrong way. You know, just may God help us to all learn to be a bit more diplomatic, a bit more conciliatory and concerned about how is this thing I'm going to say be received? Have I communicated it the way that I, I want and need to communicate it? But sometimes people will say things and Satan will use that. My father tells the story early in his Christian experience. He was hanging out with a bunch of young people in the church, 
hamburger joint after church. And one of the young ladies said to him, I love to hear everybody in the church sing except you. She didn't mean that to devastate my father, but it did. And for many, many years, in fact, from that day to the day he died, he never sang a solo in church. I heard him sing in a quartet one time, and I heard him sing a duet with my mother one year before his death. Now, my dad did not have a bad voice. He had a loud voice. You could hear him no matter how large the auditorium was, but he was so self-conscious because of something that somebody said. And here's how Satan will attack you. He will use things that somebody said that often they don't even realize the significance of what they said or how you receive that. And he will use that to beat you down. He will use that to keep you in a state where you cannot become what God wants you to become. You never fulfill what God's dream for you is because you have listened to a lie that Satan managed to speak through the voice of a friend. These are Job's friends. These weren't his enemies. But when they came to be near him and around him, they began to say some things that Satan used. Uh, you need to learn. Uh, you see, there are some who are dealing with the emotions and the feelings. Uh, you need to learn to encourage yourself in the Lord and don't become bitter against your friends because you're going to have opportunity to become bitter. There are individuals who are going to let you down at the worst time for you. I remember, this will be really, really transparent. I remember a preacher, a friend of mine years ago, said to me, whenever I get my own church, man, you're going to preach so many times, they're going to think you're on staff at my church. You're going to be, man, you're such a blessing in my life. Now, he has pastored some of the largest assemblies of God churches in the nation. I can't get past his secretary. I have never preached in the environment in which he's in. Now, I've got a choice. I can get bitter over that. I can let that color the way that I see him, that I feel toward him. Or I can make a decision not to become bitter. You see, I have friends who's, I had a friend who said to me, he said, Michael, I'm, I'm looking forward to having you come back to my church again. He said, but right now, he said, you scare my people half to death. He said, God showed up, but they weren't expecting that, man. They did not know what. He said, I'm going to have to begin to prepare them. Because he said, I want them to experience what has took place when you're among us. He said, but I recognize, I have a good Baptist church. And, and they don't know how to be Pentecostal yet. So I have to understand, he's not, it's a, not a personal thing. He's saying, I've got to have to bring them along. You see, there are going to be things happen. You have to make a decision. How am I going to respond to that? Job decides not to become, he can become bitter. Or he can become better. You need to learn how to allow others to pick you up without destroying you. Some of you, though, need to learn how to pick better friends. Just saying. A sixth type of attack is seen in Job chapter 7, verses 3, 4 through 7, 3 and 4 and verse 7, verse 3. So I've been allotted months of futility and nights of misery have been assigned to me. When I lie down, I think, how long before I get up? The night drags on and I toss till dawn. Verse 7, remember, O Lord, that my life is but a breath. My eyes will never see happiness again. Job is experiencing feelings of hopelessness. He feels like it's futile. Life is full of misery with no evidence going to get better. When you are feeling like it is totally hopeless, you are probably under a satanic attack. You see, God has programmed people to be full of faith and hope. That's default. That's how God created us. 
We are to be people of hope and people of faith. That's who we basically are. But when you become somebody that you become so full of hopelessness that you never, you're the young man, I'm standing in this place of business and he says to me, it has always been this way. It will always be this way. It will never get any better. Hopeless. He's under a satanic attack. Now abides faith. Hope and love. The complete absence of hope may be a sign you come under satanic attack. The next level is suggested in the same chapter 7, verse 20. If I have sinned, what have I done to you, O watcher of men? Why have you made me your target? Have I become a burden to you? Now Satan is suggesting to Job that Job has become God's target. Go ahead, Job. Just blame God for everything that is happening in your life. Satan wants to remove you from the awareness of God's love for you. Can I say that again? Satan wants to remove you from the awareness of God's love for you. He wants you to think God is against me. I don't know why, but God doesn't like me. He likes everybody else. He really likes Pastor Ralph and Kathy. I mean, he really likes them. But he really doesn't like me. And he will try to get you to think and to feel that way. Until you begin to believe that God is your problem. I don't know why, what it is God has against me. Everybody else, it always works well for them, but it never works out for me. I guess God just doesn't like me. Do you ever feel like God plays favorites and you're not on the list? <laughs> I heard, heard a pastor in Australia talking about pastor one of the very, very large churches. And he said, I know Brian. So he ain't that spiritual. He said, why does God seem to like him and doesn't seem to like me? Why do they always get the breaks? Why does God always smiles on them? Careful. Satan is trying to get you to feel that God is against you. The truth of the matter was it was Satan that was against Job. It was God that had put the limits because if Satan had the freedom, he'd have done a whole lot more. And God said, no, no, Satan, you're not going to go there. I'll let you go this far, but no further. This is a test case. I'm going to let you go this far. But Job is dealing with the feelings that God is against me. Let me give you one more. Job chapter 9, verses 27 and 28. Job is fighting to keep a positive mental attitude. Here's what he says. If I say, I will forget my complaint. I will change my expression and smile. I still dread all my sufferings. For I know you will not hold me innocent. Job cannot stay positive no matter what. If you are normally a positive person, but no matter how hard you try, you just cannot stay positive. You may be under satanic attack. You may be looking at more than just the normal ebbs and flows of human emotion. If you're normally an upbeat, positive individual, but you find yourself in a moment, that no matter how hard you try, you say, I'm going to be positive today. I'm going to smile today. I'm going to bless everybody today. And by breakfast time, you're ready to take somebody's head off. And, and, and she's like, that's not normally me. Maybe. You're like Job, who's saying, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be this. But he says, but I just can't get there. Why? He's under a satanic attack. You see, often we limit satanic attacks in our minds to a certain types of things. Where Satan wants to destroy and come against you in other areas. I was, I was in a prayer line. In fact, I was in a prayer line. I was in a service in 
pastor of that church, Revival Church, we're just sitting in the congregation, gets up from his seat, walks across the platform, walks down the steps, and walks right up to me. I didn't notice. I'm, I suppose I'm worshiping God, but my wife was watching him. And I open my eyes, and this guy's standing right there. And he says to me, Preacher, you're under satanic attack. I didn't realize that what I was dealing with was, but it was. And something happened by way of a breakthrough coming out of that service. Some of you are under satanic attack. The feelings of hopelessness when that's not who you are. The feelings of depression. And it's not a physiological thing. The feelings of God is against me. When you know in your head that God is not against you. The feelings that your friends are betraying you and you know really that your friends love you. But all of those emotions and the feelings are there. You're under an attack from the adversary who is seeking to destroy who you are. Because if he can destroy who you are on the inside, he'll effectively curtail God's plan for your life. And the value that you can be to the kingdom of God and the lives of others. So how do you deal with this stuff? Let me give you just some thoughts real quickly. We've been given a spiritual armor to wear to protect us from the attacks of the wicked one. In Ephesians chapter 6. You have your Bible. Maybe you like to go there. Ephesians chapter 6. Beginning in verse number 10. Be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can stand against the devil's schemes. Our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, he's established who our enemy really is. It's not the guy sitting next to you in the pew. Somebody said to love the whole world is no chore, just the guy that lives next door. Your struggle is against not flesh and blood, but against the rulers of the darkness. Therefore, put on the full armor of God. So that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you've done everything to stand, stand firm then with, and he gives us a list, the belt of truth. Buckled around your waist. This speaks first of all to me that Jesus is truth. So put on the Lord Jesus Christ. This speaks to me of personal integrity. When Satan begins to speak. You see Job understood that he didn't say that. He said I do know that I've been a person of integrity. Live a life of truth. Then he said, the breastplate of righteousness in verse 14. Jesus is my righteousness. I stand complete in God because of what Jesus has done. I come before the Father because of what Jesus has done for me. I can never grasp that. I stand not because of the good deeds I've done. God is not impressed because I sit on airplane seats. It doesn't make me more spiritual. It just makes my tailbone tired. My wife calls frequent flyer points punishment for having sat on the airplane seats for so long. I receive from the Lord, not so I can show him my ticket stubs, but because of what Jesus has done. And because of who Jesus is. And so when Satan begins to remind you of all of this stuff, uh, he begins to cause you to feel hopeless, to feel depressed, to feel that God is against you. You remember, I am righteous because of who Jesus is. My righteousness is in him. And I receive because of who he is and what he's done. Your feet are shod with peace. Jesus has given you his peace. Believe for it. 
Your feet are shed with the preparation of the gospel. You have a shield of faith. This shield is especially designed to extinguish flaming arrows from the evil one. That's why God gives you faith. Because he knows the devil is going to shoot at you. So he says, I want you to have faith. I want you to understand that as you practice faith, it's going to quench. You see, the more you know someone, let me put it this way, the more you know someone, the more the trust in them is developed. When I first go to a church to preach, I am relying totally upon the pastor's relationship with his people. People will open their hearts to hear me because they trust their pastor. But the more often I speak at a church, the relationship develops to the point that now they begin to say, we not only trust you because of pastor, but now we've come to know you. I was preaching in New Zealand when the pastor's wife said to me, you need to understand these people in this valley trust you. Probably more than the American they've ever had here. They trust you. You know, a relationship has been established. I trust my wife because I know her. And if there are things that she may do that I may not understand at the moment, I trust her. Somebody said to my secretary one day, did you know that pastor believes so-and-so? She said, I'll categorically deny that. She said, I don't even have to ask him. She said, I know him. I know what he believes. I know what he thinks. I know how he feels. He doesn't believe that. I don't even know to this day what it was I supposedly believed. But she said, I know him. When you know him. I love the words of Mrs. Albert Einstein when somebody asked her, do you understand the theory of relativity? She said, no. But I understand Albert. Do I understand everything that's going on in God's head? Are you kidding? But I understand his heart. And when I do not understand what he's doing here, I trust what's going on here. And in the moments of the attack from Satan, You pick up that shield of faith because you say, I don't understand, but I know who my Redeemer is. And I trust Him. That I have experience with Him that causes me to know He's trustworthy. And then put on the helmet of salvation. First, you've been given salvation. Seek to understand what it means. It affects everything. Helmet covers the head, the mind. Bring your mind under the control of the Word of God. I make a decision every day. Whose whose testimony am I going to believe? Am I going to believe what the book says? Or am I going to believe what Joe Blow says? Am I going to believe what they tell me on CNN? Or am I going to believe what they tell me in God's Word? Am I going to believe what some guy I don't know who writes somewhere on a blog says? Or am I going to believe what God says? At some point, I cause my mind to put on the helmet Begin let my mind begin to think what God's Word says. And finally, well, two more things. Pick up the sword of the Spirit. It's God's Word. Use the Word of God against Satan. It is written. I was on a prayer line dealing with, it was a deliverance session. I don't know what prompted me to do this. Well, I guess I do. It was the impression of the Lord. But I was dealing with this rather stubborn spirit. (laughs) I just kind of felt to say this. I said, if you don't come out, I'm going to get the sword of the Spirit and cut you out. It was very interesting what happened. This piercing shriek, no! Don't get the sword. I thought, man, I like that. Where's the sword, man? You know, I'm gonna... Satan is not overly impressed with your word. He's terribly impressed with God's Word. And in the midst of the spiritual attack, you bring against him what God says. Now, just waving the sword may not impress him. 
He wants to know, do you know what to do with the thing? So stick him with it. And finally, pray in the Spirit on all occasions. There is something so powerful in this spiritual battle in praying in the Holy Spirit. Do you always feel emotionally charged up when you're praying in the Holy Spirit? No. I have prayed for an hour in tongues and felt nothing the whole time. But the Word of God tells me when I'm praying in the Spirit, I'm building my faith. And so I just practice praying in the Holy Spirit. I pray in the Spirit when I drive. Sometimes my wife prays in the Spirit when I drive. Probably different reasons. I pray in the Spirit when I take off and when I land on airplanes. I prayed for as long as nine hours straight praying in the Holy Spirit. As I've discovered, something happens in the spiritual realm when you're praying in the Holy Spirit. Man, I don't know about this getting filled with the Holy Ghost stuff. Do I have to talk in tongues? No, you get to. You see, it's not just about praying a few phrases at the altar. I've learned that in this spiritual battle that I'm in, praying in the Holy Spirit is one of the greatest weapons that God has given me. When my mind does not know how to pray, which is frequent. In fact, I'm finding myself so often these days saying, God, I do not know how to pray. But your word tells me in Romans chapter, when I know not what to pray for, the Holy Spirit makes intercession for me. And I pray in the Holy Spirit. Stand with me, please. You've been incredibly patient this evening. I would like to tell you that the journey is going to be so much easier in the days in front of you. And I'd like to tell you that. I probably would be lying to you. I'm not a negative individual. I'm a very optimistic person, by and large. But I understand that there are things in Scripture that suggest the closer we come, to the return of the Lord Jesus Christ, the more we can anticipate spiritual battles. Somebody asked me, do you think that this particular hurricane or this particular act of nature was the judgment of God? I said, I think that the scripture says this, there are going to be birth pangs in nature before Jesus returns and that we are seeing and will see increased activity in nature I don't know what happened here in Indiana because I, I missed it but I was in Missouri on the last day of July and they were announcing it was the driest month in the history in recorded history in that state and then I was in Oklahoma a few days after that, and they were announcing that it was the hottest July on record. My wife and I were in New Zealand in July, and about 10 o'clock one night, there was a shaking going on. 7.2 earthquake. It was an interesting experience. I'll be just as happy not to go through another one. Was it the judgment of God? No, it's birth pains. There's going to be more of it. But not just the birth pangs in nature. Satan, the scripture says, knowing that his time is short. You can expect spiritual war around your life to become more intense. You see, right now, my wife and I live right now with this mix of the greatest joy that we've ever known and the greatest grief. The greatest awareness of the battle spiritually and the greatest sense of victory on the inside. I tell people I'm not 
a Pollyanna that doesn't believe that problems exist. They do exist. There is spiritual conflict. Not everybody's going to like you. There's going to be some people that feel called in life to make you miserable. If you're happy, they're not. You know, I really struggled with that as a pastor. I thought everybody would like me. And then I discovered some saints ain't. You know, some people just... You have to deal with it. And God is giving to you both the understanding that's going to happen and is giving to you guidelines in His Word how you can come through those moments victorious. One of the, and I love the way the Apostle Paul puts this in 2 Corinthians. He said to the Corinthian church, you helped together by prayer. He talks about a season in his life under great spiritual struggle. And he said, you helped me as you prayed for me. Jesus said to Peter, Satan hath desired to have you. They could sift you and destroy you. That's satanic attack. That's the purpose, bring destruction. And Jesus said, but I have prayed for you. How did he pray? That your faith will not fail. But I want you to pray that I'll never again have another problem. Well, we can pray that Jesus will kill you. Just take you to heaven because that's the only way you're going to escape him. But we can believe that God is going to cause your faith not to fail. And what Satan means for destruction, God uses. I can't preach that whole sermon, but two thoughts. I love, I love what Paul says, the Amplified Version, book of Philippians. He talks about being in jail. And he says this. He says, it turned out for my salvation, the spiritual health and well-being, he said, of myself and for the furtherance of the gospel. Can you imagine? Here's Paul in jail. What good can possibly come out of being in jail? I'll tell you what it was. Paul picks up a pen and he starts writing letters. Every time a preacher preaches from Ephesians or Philippians or Colossians, Satan goes, dummy, dummy, dummy. He puts Paul in prison to shut him up and God turns it around and gives Paul a platform that is bigger than it ever would have had any other way. Joseph's brothers, Joseph says to them in Genesis chapter 50, you meant it for evil, but God. I'm not saying it's all good that happens to you. I'm not saying it's all God that happens to you. Satan brought the attacks against Job. The father filtered it. This far and no farther. He'll never let Satan bring against you something that is bigger than you and he together. And then he records everything that happens so that when Satan begins to do those things, you'll say, "Uh uh-huh, I recognize that. That's what he did against Job. He made those feelings of helplessness, depression, friends of forsaken, sickness, the loss of resources. Make me feel like God's against me. I recognize that. That's what he did to Job. And now you've got that information. And then he says, now, put on my armor. Put on my word. Put on Jesus. Get in my presence. Start worshiping me. Pray in the Spirit. Take the sword of the Spirit. And you will discover you are well equipped for this war that you're engaged in. And I love that thought, we help together. 
What I'm going to do in a moment is I'm going to open the altar. Some of you, you're in the spiritual battle tonight. And we're going to do two things. We're going to come and stand at this front, and we're going to lift our hands, and we're going to worship. Not because I feel like it, but because, first of all, he's worthy. And secondly, it gives the devil a nervous breakdown. He's thrown everything he can throw at you, and you're going, I love you, Jesus. I worship you. You're wonderful. And you're singing praises to Jesus. And Satan's going, ah! I'm going to worship. And then I'm going to ask leaders to just join me in wandering around among the crowd as we just feel prompted. I'm going to lay hands on you and just ask God to come alongside of you. I'm not going to ask him to remove all the adversity. I'd like to do that. But I love what it says in the book of Numbers about they're going into the land and the enemy's there. And they said, they're bread. They're bread for us. I'm going to ask that God allows you to come through what you're in in great victory. Having learned and developed and grown. And you're a bigger threat. Where Satan says, why didn't I leave them alone? I started pressuring them and now look what's happened. That's what I'm going to pray for you. That God will cause your faith not to fail. You'll become more than a conqueror. Now for those in this room that you've not yet given your life to Jesus, you're in the battle too, just don't know it. And Satan does not like you. He's trying his best to take you to hell. And that's not because he intends to party with you there. I've already checked. The party is in the other place. There is no party in hell. Weeping, wailing, gnashing of teeth. That is not party sounds. Revelation describes heaven with singing and laughing, dancing, rejoicing. That's party sounds. So if you've not yet made a decision to give your life to Jesus, I'm going to encourage you to do that tonight. And when others come to the front of this building, I want you to come with them. And you can grab me or grab one of the leaders who will be praying and say, man, I, I just want to ask Jesus into my life. We will pray with you and lead you to Jesus just like somebody led us to Jesus. Because God wants that for you.